start with a, an obvious statement, and that is that we live in an angry world, which should be obvious to anyone who participates in social media. The New Orleans Saints, for example, recently staged an angry parade in protests of the officiating at the NFC Championship game. This past fall, the author, Rebecca Tracer, released a book titled Good and Mad, The Revolutionary Power of Women's Anger. Anger at repeated experiences of injustice has fueled movements like Black Lives Matter and Me Too. The Catholic faithful have been angry for a long time at the failure of bishops to address the problem of clergy abuse of both boys and nuns. In the movie The First Purge, the principal character says this, if we want to save our country, we must release all our anger in one night. And so one night a year is devoted to allowing citizens to do violence of their own choosing in whatever way with no consequences. A Time Magazine article in 2017 titled The Las Vegas Shooting in Our Age of Anger said this, Americans have, been made, have made something of a fetish of our rage of late, a fact that's even been leaking into our language. The base is never just animated, it's always enraged. Healthcare debates are never spirited, they're always furious. In the run-up to the 2016 election, a CNN ORC poll found that 69% of Americans reported being either very or somewhat angry at the state of the nation. What Bernie Sanders said was this. He said, I am angry and millions of Americans are angry. Now, people get angry at themselves as well. They say things like, I'm stupid, or I'm fat, or I'm ugly, or I always fail. Some people erupt in sudden fury, as you might know firsthand from your home life. Others simmer in passive aggressive behavior, which likewise you may know from your home life. So what exactly are we to do with our experiences of anger or of those nearby? Do we suppress it? Do we deny it? Do we indulge it? And what exactly are we to do with the boil of angry emotions that at times threaten to turn our revenge fantasies into reality? One way forward I'd like to suggest to you is to read what is sometimes called the curse psalms or the imprecatory psalms or what I will call the psalms of anger. It begs the question, of course, which Christians have been asking for 2,000 years, can we really pray them? Aren't these prayers diametrically opposed to the peaceable kingdom that Christ announces? Didn't Jesus himself forbid us to curse our enemies? Didn't he command us to pray for those who persecute us? And is C.S. Lewis right that one way of dealing with these terrible or dare we say contemptible psalms is simply to leave them alone? I'd like to think that C.S. Lewis is wrong on this one account. We don't leave them alone. What I'd like to propose to you today is that God gives us the angry Psalms in order to help us to feel angry without being undone by our anger. God gives us these Psalms to rescue us from our desires to curse others and to do violence to them. God gives us these Psalms in order to heal and unite us rather than to divide us. So what is a cursed psalm? What are its dominant thematic concerns? And how do we pray these faithfully? Those are my three questions. Let me take each in turn. First, what is a cursed psalm? As biblical scholars will define it, it is a psalm in which the psalmist prays angry or imprecatory prayers against his enemies and those he perceives to be God's enemies. The psalmist, in short, curses his enemy. It's what the Psalms of Anger do. What are its thematic concerns? Well, let me suggest four for today. The first thematic concern is that in the Psalms of Anger, we encounter the ubiquitous presence of enemies. If we take the Psalms seriously, rather than trying to tidy them up 
we have to reckon with the fact that the Psalter is awash in enemies. The German scholar Eric Zinger explains it this way. He says, the people who pray the Psalms feel themselves surrounded, threatened, and shot at by a gigantic army, or they are like an animal pursued by hunters and trappers, or they see themselves surrounded and attacked by rapacious wild beasts, trampling bulls, or poisonous snakes. Translate that into the daily news headlines or social media headlines. Now, it's important to stress that praying against one's enemies in the Psalms is not a matter of mere venting. It's a matter rather of honestly naming one's experience of enemies and of entrusting one's enemies to God. Now, Psalm 139 verses 21 to 24 illustrates, I think, the paradigmatic pattern for how we can pray against our enemies. And it begins in anger. Do I not hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, to use the King James? Am I not aggrieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Immediately following the imprecation or the curse, the psalmist prays this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Now, it needs to be stated, because this is sometimes forgotten, that the movement from one statement to the other does not come easily, and it rarely happens in the moment. In fact, it often takes a great deal of time before you can move from verses 21 and 22 to verses 23 and 24, and we can perhaps assume this for the psalmist as well. But that's, in fact, where the psalmist invites us to go. The second thematic concern is this, that where the people of God are oppressed, the character of God is at stake. Psalm 139 again proves helpful, again in the King James. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God, depart from me therefore, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. The idea is this. If violence is done against human creatures, as the psalmists see it, made in the image of God, then that divine image is susceptible to defacement. If human community is ruptured by injustice, then the purposes of the divine communion are jeopardized. When tribe slaughters tribe and nation wars against nation, then the God who made every tribe and nation needs to step in and to save that which is his. If damage comes to creation, the psalmist tells us, then the creator's work is threatened. For the psalmist, the language of vengeance is a way to say this. This world is your idea, God. The human life is your doing, God. And if you don't stop, don't, don't do something to stop the wicked from destroying it all, it's your reputation that's at stake. Now, when the psalmist experiences human justice or a terror of nature, well, they feel acutely that the character of God is at stake. And this is, in fact, what Christians have felt for 2,000 years. When violence happens, it's always about God. Third, the experience of violence inevitably provokes hyperbolic language as a way to express the shocking violation of the good order of God's world. Psalm 109 in the NRSV has a psalmist saying this about his enemies. May his days be few, may his children be orphans, his wife a widow, may his children wander about and beg, may they be driven out of the ruins they inhabit, may there be no one to do him a kindness, may his memory be cut off from the earth. Now this obviously is cursing language. He is cursing. It's harsh and it's unnerving and it's quite cruel. Let me suggest, however, a hypothesis that might make sense of this kind of language. The hyperbolic, perhaps obscene nature of this language occupies the same basic territory as profane language. What I mean is this. As the anthropologist Mary Douglas has argued in her book, Purity and Danger, every society arranges itself around an orderly system that enables it to thrive, to survive and thrive. She calls this system of self-organization purity. It's a technical term. In her understanding, purity is about what enhances life, like justice and honesty and clean water and the making of hospitals. And it's about what hinders life, like injustice and deceit 
and unsanitary bathrooms and the making of sex slaves. Now, the opposite of purity in her account is disorder. So while purity is related to order, it is also related to holiness. The holy space is the space of wholeness, where everything is right and well, and thus also a place of life. To step outside of this holy space is to step into what she calls profane space. So, for example, in Israel, the leper is excluded from the inner spaces of the temple, the architectural symbol of this whole place called Eden, because he represents an image of disorder. Because of his physical mispicturation, he belongs outside of the temple. Now, the term profane from the Latin profanus suggests the idea of being outside the temple. Profane space is the opposite, therefore, of holy or whole space. Profane language, accordingly, is language that lies outside of this whole space where everything is right in the world. In technical terms, it's called dirty language. Now, the function of profane language is to facilitate the expression of uncommon, disordered, and undesirable experiences. So, for example, when the carpenter hammers his thumb He screams the S word because it's not part of the order of carpentry to hammer one's thumb. During the Vietnam War, as another example, both advocates and protesters of the war called it an effed up war because everything about the military conflict felt inhumane, dehumanizing. This, I believe, is partly what is at work in the curse psalms. The psalmist uses a kind of profane language in order to give expression to profane experiences experiences that violate human dignity and that desecrate God's good purposes for the world. Lastly, cursed psalms point the way to healing. In this last point, I'd like to focus on one particular but also rather challenging psalm, Psalm 137, the one about dashing the babies against the rocks. While the first two sections of the psalm have generated vast number of musical and poetic settings, The third section has been removed largely from liturgical repertoires throughout church history, almost unanimously. But we're wrong to do this, argues the Croatian-born theologian Miroslav Volf. He insists that psalms such as these remain within our devotional worship practices for this reason. He says such psalms may point to a way out of slavery to revenge and into the freedom of forgiveness. Now, obviously, that's easier said than done. But Christian practices that are devoid of this demanding psalmic language leave us vulnerable, I suggest, to theologies and pastoral practices that are incapable of dealing with the experiences of anger that leads so easily to violence with its systemic multi-generational reverberations played out on the public scene and in the privacy of our own homes. Now, Miroslav Wolf argues that Christians should, in fact, read Psalm 137 in their devotional, worship, personal, and public practices. For this reason, he says, by placing unattended rage before God, we place both our unjust enemy and our own vengeful self face-to-face with a God who loves and does justice. Hidden in the dark chambers of our hearts and nourished by the system of darkness, hate grows and seeks to infest everything with its hellish will to inclusion. So he asks the question, where is our anger safe? If it's safe anywhere, he says, surely it must be safe within this worship space. In his own words, it's not safe simply bottled up in my own heart. It's not safe in some public space of venting our collective feelings. It is safe in the space where it is placed before the one God of both those whose children have been dashed against the rocks and of those who did the dashing of those children against the rocks. To conclude, St. Paul once said, be angry, but do not sin. Now, as somebody who has struggled with anger his whole life, this is easier said than done, I know. Thankfully, the Psalms show us a way forward, how to pray angry prayers without being overcome by one's anger. Or as Eugene Peterson once put it, how to cuss without cussing. (laughs) As hard as it is, or it may be to resist the desire to take revenge against those who have wronged us, like Liam Neeson in the Taken movies or the Punisher in the Marvel series. 
This is what the Psalms ask us to do. They never deny our anger at being wronged, but they do deny us the right to take vengeance into our own hands. It is in this sense, perhaps, that the Psalms of anger are essentially prayers of relinquishment. To pray this rhetoric of violence is to see to God my desires to become violent. It's a way to say, I give you my pain, I give you my anger, I give you my desire to exact vengeance. So whether it's family troubles or physical hardships or political turmoil or religious strife or racial violence, to pray these psalms of anger becomes, I believe, an occasion to receive the healing work of God in our lives. To pray them finally, I believe, is to trust that Christ himself prays these same prayers in us and for us and by his spirit does something much better than managing our angers. He sets our hearts free to love not just our, our neighbor, but our enemy too, in a way that we never imagined possible. Thank you. Thank you.